Hey, I want you to invite you to take your sermon note sheet and to doodle along with me as we, um, as we go through our sermon. But I realized before that, grab your bulletin. It was supposed to be on the PowerPoint. My bad, it's not. Our new memory verse, our new scripture, okay? So on the back of your bulletin, at the very bottom of it, it says our memory verse. So this is what we're working on. So let's, um, it's Psalm 17. It's actually one of my favorite, favorite psalms. So let's, um, let's say it together. Ready? Show the wonder of your great love, you who save by your right hand those who take refuge in you from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. So just for posterity, let's do it again, okay? Just do it again. Ready? Show the wonder of your great love, you who save by your right hand those who take refuge from, from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. So a cowboy walked into a West Texas bar, went up to the bartender and ordered three beers. We are Presbyterians, right? Okay. Um, he ordered three beers sat down and he took a sip out of one and then the second and then the third and he just kept doing that till he was done and he went up to the, the bartender to order three more and the bartender said, you know, son, if I just open them one at a time, it, it wouldn't go flat, it might last a lot longer. And, 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 the, and the cowboy said, no, no, you got to understand, see, I have two brothers and they, one's an Australian, one is um, back east coast and we have this tradition of drinking beer together, and we said this is how we would do it. So the bartender said, well, that's a nice custom. And, and uh, so weeks went by, and, and this was a tradition at least once a week. And then one week, the cowboy came in, and he only ordered two bottles of beer. And, and everybody kind of knew the routine, and they got really quiet. And after he had drank those two. He came back up, ordered two more, and, and the bartender said, my condolences for your loss. And the cowboy looked at him kind of funny and said, well, oh, oh, you see, me and the missus, we just joined the Baptist church, and I had to quit drinking. <laughs> but it hasn't affected my brothers much. So Every one of us, folks, every one of us grows up in an environment that shapes us, shapes us, right? So, so we learn what's appropriate, what to say, what not to say, uh, what to wear or not to wear, where to go, where we shouldn't go, who to hang out with, who not to hang out with, how we treat others, who's in, who's out, these all shape us and create within us values and beliefs. We all have them. We all have them. So it's, it's why the cowboy could say in one breath, I'm not drinking, and in another breath, I'm drinking. Right? Values, beliefs. So in Matthew 15, Jesus is encountering some Pharisees, and um, they're talking about what makes a person kosher, right? Kosher, clean. And, and, and Jesus said this in verse 11. He said, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles the person. So Jesus, what he's speaking about, folks, it's values and beliefs that live in our hearts. They live in our hearts. And, and guess where your, your values and beliefs emerge from? Well, sometimes it's a wounded and tattered heart, isn't it? So the values can be just a, a mixture of things, and, and they come, so we learn them, but they come from communities like our home, our, our school, our network of people. They come from church or not being in church. They come from the wounds we receive in life. That's where they come from. All these things play a role in formulating our hearts, which are full of our values and our beliefs. Now, 
Some of your values and beliefs and mine are just spot on, right? Spot on there. They make, they line up with Jesus. We're good. Other though, there's another part of us, right? Where I'm not sure Jesus smiles about some of my values and, and my beliefs. They're not always, these values and beliefs, they're, they're not always easy for us to see about ourselves, are they? They're not always thought through or thought about, but we feel them deeply. And they emerge. They emerge. They are more, they are a noun, but they're experienced as a verb. Does that make sense to you? That's how we experience them and how we, we see them. And, and you know, you and I can try to hide our values and beliefs, but they have a way uh, where, where everything's just fine, but, but they have a way of, of leaking out of us. It's what happens. When we really notice values and beliefs, it's when they come in to uh, encounter, they collide, they clash with other people's values and beliefs. That makes sense to you. It's when we notice them, really. So it's all fun and games when everybody, when our beliefs are the same. But I'll tell you what, when they collide and they're not, that's where tension comes from. Often. I mean, there's other things I, I realize that, that do that. And I want to say this. If my beliefs and values, your beliefs and values, never come into conflict with Jesus, then it's because you've got your super saint mojo on. Just saying. Here's a super saint. Uh, Drew Brees, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you all follow football, but actually he is a follower of Jesus. And he plays for the saints, so I'll show you a better super saint right now, right? St. Patrick, and that's a supersized saint. So either we've got our lives together or we're just not paying attention to what's going on between us and Jesus because we find that we struggle. So when we come into conflict with Jesus, okay? By the way, happened to me this morning. Just fasten up right now. Probably happened in the afternoon. I'm guessing uh, you too. Got really quiet. <laughs> so when they collide with Jesus, though, this is what I want to ask. Will we still partner with Jesus? Will we? Will we still uh, let his values and beliefs influence, infiltrate our hearts? This is called discipleship. It's what we're called to be doing. So listen, we are close, closer to Holy Week, aren't we? We're, we're moving in that direction. And what we are, are talking about on our way there are some of the stories that Jesus told. And, and you know what? Jesus, when he told stories, they revealed beliefs and values. It's what they reveal. And this is what's near and dear to his heart on the way to the cross. And, and what's great about stories, folks, is that when they're good stories, we identify something or someone in them. So, just want you to pay attention to where it resonates with you. Even if that resonation feels like a collide or a conflict, just notice. So, Luke 15, we read this. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. Him as Jesus, right? But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, man, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So I hope you can feel the tension that's in the air as two distinct values clash. They are not the same. Pharisees, teachers of the law, tax collectors, sinners. Now, last week, we talked about the first half of this story. We call the, the, lost, the, the prodigal son, but maybe it should have been called the good father. That's what some folks have, have called it. Did you love it when the father welcomed his son home? Did you love it? Did it just connect with you? Did it feel good because there's grace and mercy? That's what the tax collectors are feeling as Jesus is telling this story. They're, they're feeling the grace and the mercy of, of God coming. And, and probably they're a little bit surprised. 
because they haven't heard that there's that much grace and mercy. On the other hand, perhaps you felt a little resentful or frustrated with the father who welcomed home his worthless, no good son who wasted his whole inheritance. And I'll tell you what, that's where the religious folks are. They're frustrated. Probably a little bit stronger than frustrated. They're angry. They're, they're muttering. Jesus, why are you with these people? Why are you with them? Now we're going to meet the older brother, okay? The older brother, starting with verse 25, Luke 15. All this time, his older brother was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in, and as he approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. Calling over one of the houseboys, he asked what was going on. He told them, your brother came home. Your, your father's ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. And the older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look, how many years have I stayed here serving you? never giving you one moment of grief, but you have, you have never thrown a party for me and my friends. Then this son of yours, who has thrown away your money on whores, shows up and you go all out with a feast. And his father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me in all the time. Everything that, that is mine is yours, but this is a wonderful time. We have, and we have to celebrate that this, your, this brother of yours was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. Lost and he's found. So, the past three months, while well, the younger brother's been off playing, right? Wasting his inheritance. What's the older brother been doing? dutifully working, following what his father said. He's worked as he always has worked. I think he probably noticed his father's pain, right? His countenance over his younger brothers taking his inheritance and, and running. And as time moved on, I wonder if the older, elder brother Wondered when his father was going to get over this. <laughs> when are you going to get over this, dad? And then I think he grew a little resentful that his dad was so preoccupied with that son of his who ran away, stole so much, it seemed, of, of the family. And well, that worthless brother comes home, <laughs> and what does dad do? Throws a party for crying out loud. You know, in our, our story, this is really important. The elder brother, his response is just as disrespectful to his father as the younger brothers. We don't often think about it that way, but culturally speaking, it is. He refuses to honor his father's right to restore his brother because his father had every right to do that. It's within his power. The older brother wants nothing to do with that younger brother. And you remember last week we talked about the Kazaza ceremony where as the younger brother came home, if the father doesn't get there in time, all the men in that village are going to gather around that younger boy and they're going to humiliate him and mock him. They're going to take a vase throw it on the ground and say, as you said your father was dead to you when you took your inheritance, you are dead to us. And they would have shunned him. That's what the older brother, I get the feeling, wishes would have happened. How can you just forgive? You know, he justifies his anger towards his dad by saying, I've always worked, dad. I've always done what you've wanted. I, I've always done the right thing. You, you owe me. You owe me. 
You, you never celebrate me. I'm worthy. He is not worthy. It feels like you're very ungrateful, Dad, for all I've done. You know, right from the start, the religious folks that are in this area where Jesus is teaching, they're just beside themselves. They can't believe Jesus really would associate with those kind of people. They believed they were good enough, followed the rules well enough, proved their worth to God that in, in some fashion, it's almost like they merited their salvation their relationship. Now, this is a simplified way to look at it, but it's almost as if they believed there's a tipping point. If I do enough good things, the scale is going to go in my favor. My favor. You know, the, the, the Muslim faith believes that at the end of your life, you stand before God and he weighs out the good and bad. Okay? Okay? And if you're good enough, you make it. And there's probably a few other ways you get in. But that's the primary way. And I want you to know that's also uh, the Mormon theology. It's last week, we, I, I used a quote from Bono from the band U2. And he talked about karma, right? Karma is, is you give and you get back in like kind. In other words, you earn your way. And in many ways, that's what these religious folks were agreeing with. So you don't come humbly, necessarily. You don't come in need of surrender. You certainly don't submit to the, the Father or maybe even God. Because for crying out loud, who needs grace when you can earn it? Right? Why would you want grace when you can just do enough things? So... In some ways, that was probably a little exaggerative, but it carries the point. So have you ever felt that way? You ever found yourself feeling like this older brother? You've worked at your Christian life for crying out loud. You've put your time in. You aren't perfect, but it, you, you say to yourself, well, at least I didn't do that like they did. You ever heard yourself saying that? Thinking those thoughts? Well, at least I didn't do that, I must be better because of this. And, and what this means, folks, is, is that when we talk this way, we have a list, okay? We have a list. I have a list. It, it's full of values and beliefs that I hold dear and near. And it's really easy to appraise and critique others based on my list, right? Right? So, after church, this, this several years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Peterson were walking out together. Their children are off talking to friends, and, and Mrs. Peterson says to her husband, did you notice that Jones girl? I think she's coloring her hair. Mr. Peterson said, no, nah, I didn't notice. Then Mrs. Then Mrs. Um, Peterson says, and, and that dress Mrs. Hansen was wearing, really? Don't tell me that's appropriate for a mother of two. And Mr. Peterson said, I really didn't notice, dear. For heaven's sakes, Mrs. Peterson says, hands on her hips. A lot of good going to church does you. <laughs> Our list. Maybe those things aren't on your list, but we find... If we go to church very long, we, we, we find them, and, 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 but we've kept it, God. And so we become, in some fashion, morally or spiritually superior to others, or so we think. And so we look down. And by the way, you don't have to be in church to have a list, right? I think everybody has one in some fashion. And it's not that you keep it better. You just keep it better than other people keep your list. <laughs> they may not even know your list exists, but by golly, you're holding them. I'm holding them to it. By the way, what's on yours? What's on your list? 
Probably some very important and good things. I would venture good things. Growing up, um, the list, and I've told you this before, was don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't go with wild girls that do, right? That was the list. You know that list, or maybe you heard about that sort of list. You know, I, I was realizing when I was in high school, though, that this puts Jesus, that little list I just mentioned, really puts Jesus in an awkward situation. Because... At the, at the party in Cana, he was at a wedding. Some of you know this story. He, um, he's told the wine runs out, and he, and he goes and he makes more wine. My list, don't drink, don't chew. Oh, interesting. And then my, I was told in, in this church that I grew up, well, Jesus didn't really actually make wine. He made grape juice. And then the folks were so drunk, they didn't know the difference. And I'm thinking, you mean Jesus was at a party where people were getting drunk? It's just going south, right? It's just going down. So, what's on your list and my list? They're probably a little more diverse. They, they, they are, when we, when we keep a list, we think it makes God smile on us more. It's what we think. So, maybe that whole smoking and drinking is on your list. It's on my family's list. My parents, at least. Maybe on your list is going to church regularly, praying a lot, reading your Bible. Because if if you do those things like I do, your life's going to be a lot better and won't be so messy. That's what we think. By the way, going to church, reading your Bible, praying is a good thing. It's just how we approach it, right? Maybe it's um, you don't hang out with certain people, those kind of people, whatever those kind of people are. Maybe it's just trying harder because if you just try harder, you'll make it. It's on your list. Maybe, I know this is meddling, but maybe it's be a Republican. But I have plenty of friends that would say, no, as a Christian, you really should be a Democrat. Serious. It's both. And, and, and you know, Jesus, he's not an elephant or a donkey. He's a lamb. Right? He really, he's not in either place, but he's in both places in some fashion. So our evaluating and judging others with our list. I, I'm, isn't that just make you feel like you're going to cringe? It, it's, I, I'm positive, folks, Our list is why people want to come to our church. They love feeling judged and criticized. No. There there are plenty of reasons people don't come to church, right? Let's not be those reasons. As best we can. Let's not be those reasons. Jesus says this about our list. It's not doing what you think it's doing. And we look at Jesus and say, well, what do you mean? He goes, it's inadequate. And and then we say, you mean it's bigger? It's bigger? And then he goes, well, if you're going to keep a list, there's 613 laws in the Old Testament. You might as well work on them all if you're going to keep your list. Mm. You know, Jesus is not after your list. He's after bigger things. He's after your heart. It's much bigger, much more important. And it's not that Jesus wants you to avoid, it's not that Jesus wants you to not avoid sin. He does, but he doesn't want us to become sin managers. Sin managers are those folks, it's what I grew up with and experienced and sometimes I find myself returning to. It's when we are so preoccupied with our sin and what not to do, we're not paying attention to what we should be doing or what God's calling us to So Jesus, he's after our heart, folks. And he wants us to be preoccupied with his list. And his is pretty darn short. Is it? It's from Matthew 22. Love God, love others, love yourself. It's becoming our our vision statement here. It's such a short list. And and people go, what about, what about, what about, what about? (laughs) All these other things. When we get this right, everything else takes care of itself. Just saying. You don't have to worry. 
Everything else will take care of itself, the lesser things. And the only way this becomes a reality is we have to let Jesus do surgery on our hearts and literally put them back together. Put them back together. It, it's, it's requiring that we would literally surrender ourselves to the God who runs to us. Hmm. The God who runs to us. Now, back to the story just for a minute. I know we really digressed. But I promise you, the older brother had that list. Promise. So, when the older brother refuses to come into the homecoming party, right? Because he's a shade under-impressed with his father's response. Just a bit. Culturally, in, in a very public sort of way, it's like he's slapping his father in the face. Okay? This party is not private. It's, it's the neighborhood. It's the family. And, and he is insulting and humiliating his dad by not coming in. Everyone knows he's missing. Everyone. And, and in response to his son, culturally, what the father is supposed to do, he's supposed to ignore it and act like it's not happening. And just continue with the party, take care of his son later. That's what he's supposed to do. But I want you to know, the father does exactly what he did for the younger son, for the older son. He runs to him. He goes to him. And they have this kind of amazing conversation. And by the way, by doing that, he, the father, once again, is humbling himself. Culturally. Everyone's going, what's, what's he doing? Talk to him later. No, the father says, I'm going to talk to you now. Because he's doing it out of love. Now, the elder brother assumes the father is giving the party just for the son. Because he's, he's come home, right? So in verse 30, we read this. Then this son of yours, who has thrown away your money on whores, shows up, and you go all out with a feast. That's the brother's assumption. And, and it's often what we just assume when we read this story. But if you read verse 23, we're going to go back. This is last week. We get the father's intentions. This is real important. He's talking to his servants as the younger son has just come and they've met. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. Well, he was lost, but now he's found. The celebration, folks, is the restoration. The restoration, the homecoming. It's not just, we're not celebrating that the son wasted his inheritance and it's all good, because there will probably be repercussions still from that. He's celebrating the restoration, which is what God does with us in grace when he welcomes us back. When the father in, in verse 31, which we just read a few minutes ago, we're going to read it again. It's important. We or his father said, son, he's talking to the older son who's, right? You don't understand. That's key. You're with me all the time. Everything that, that is mine is yours. Okay? Everything that is mine is yours. But this, this is a wonderful time, and we've had a, we have to have a celebration. This brother of yours, he says it again, was dead, and now he's alive. He was lost, and he's found. You know, the father is celebrating both boys. I hope you see that. All I have is yours, son. It's yours. And I love you as much as I love your brother that was very wasteful. We don't keep score. We're family. Jesus, he doesn't keep score because we're family. In fact, the scorecard is literally torn up and thrown away. The, the, the list is gone as far as Jesus sees it. When he went to the cross, which we will be investigating in a few weeks, 
He paid for our sin, offering us grace. Getting what we do not deserve. So in essence, folks, we're all welcomed to the party. All we have to do is in faith, welcome Christ into our lives. It's what we do. So Jesus, folks, he loves the religious people. He does. They, they bothered him at times. But, but he loves them deeply and dearly. And at the very same time, he loves the irreligious people. The folks that are close and the folks that are, are far away, they're all welcomed to his feast, his party, his table, because it's by grace. That's where we read Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that nobody can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. Now, that's what grace takes care of, right? If you're worried about doing good works, folks, grace, when, when we receive God's grace, the works just come. They emerge out of us because they become part of our values and our beliefs that just seem to come out. So prodigal sons, prodigal daughters, you're welcome home. You're welcome home. Jesus says, come, come, just as you are. Surrender to me, partner with me, and find life. Elder brothers and elder sisters, Jesus says, come. Let go of your list and your need to prove anything because you don't have to. The scorecard is gone. Surrender to Jesus. Partner with Jesus and find life. Find life. And, and for those that, and I, and I think this is, many of us here that do struggle with the elder brother syndrome. On the back of your sermon notes and what will come up next, I believe, is, is a way to, to work at letting go of having to prove ourselves. Sit with God and remember God's gracious forgiveness for you. Sit and remember, just ruminate. What does that look like? The price Jesus paid for you and me, just dwell on that. Meditate. What it means that God loves you. What does it mean? And the reason to obey Jesus is because we love Jesus. Let's be quiet just for a few moments and listen for the Spirit to, to speak to us about what we've been thinking about this morning. Listen. Father, Son, and Spirit, this morning we ask you just to be our, our good, good Father, to love us, Lord, as we are, not as we think we ought to be or what others tell us we ought to be, but just literally as we are. And God, we, you tell us that you will run to us, so please run to us. And may we in turn run to you. Run to you, becoming your, your sons and your daughters. 